it's always a pleasure to come to Rosevine, and one of the things that, well, it's been 20 years, I don't know if you guys realize that or not, and uh, this May will be 20 years, but every time I come, there's new people here. Amen. Every time I come, there's children here, yep. and uh, it's just a testament that in spite of the mess we may be in the middle of, uh, God still does what he does. And uh, those who are faithful, the ones he's called, will continue to be so. You've done that, and it, uh, it warms my heart to be here with you. But I want to ask a question before we have time. How many of you here, uh, today's the first time you've ever seen me? Well, quite a few. And uh, uh, there are some who haven't seen me in 20-something years that are here. And, and uh, a small group here in the front, and uh, we worshiped together years and years ago, and uh, at, at, what, at that time would have been New Hope Baptist Church uh, up on 87 years ago. And uh, uh, good to see them here, good to see your faces again. And uh, we do get the chance to connect, you know, because of this internet thing, but it's just not as good as this face-to-face -face thing. I just really am old school that way. I, don't like, I, like, I like to look at somebody and see them and hear their voice and, and uh, hear about their lives. And today we're going to spend some time sharing about our mission. For those of you uh, who may or may not know, Patty and I serve in uh, West Africa. and We've been there for a long time. Uh, our ministry is called Therefore International. And uh, what we do is where mission has joined Jesus Christ in his invitation uh, to make disciples of the nation. And we do that by serving missions um, and missionaries, and uh, both here as well as in the world, and uh, especially in West Africa. And uh, we have missionaries on the ground there that are part of our ministry and and um, we do a lot of different things in our reach. Um, when I first went to West Africa, the thought that I had was that I would just serve primarily as an evangelist that, uh, that planted churches, and we've done quite a bit of that. We've planted, we have one that we're looking at this year, a mission point, and uh, if we plant that church, it'll be our 50th church to plant. And uh, over the years, and uh, a place called uh, uh, Odomasi Aboye, and uh, great group, and uh, not unlike yourselves, uh, I'll go there sometimes on a on a Sunday night, and uh, it's in a small village compound. They don't have power there, but uh, the Coco Board has come in and put up a uh, solar light, so they have a little bit of light you know, for a couple of three or four hours in the evening time before the battery runs out. And we'll gather underneath that. And, uh, and when it runs out, they, they get out their, their phones and their flashlights and they use them. And I'm getting older, as some of you may be. I mean, it just, evidence is here that that's happening to me. And, uh, and I like to go to bed earlier than I used to. Well, these folks don't want God's word to stop. I mean, I'll get there at 6.30 and 9.30. I'm, I'm like this, and they're still bringing questions and still asking, wanting to know about this God that had sent his son to forgive their sins and to save them. And uh, so it's typically 9.30, 10, 10.30 before I get away from there. That's our new plant, and uh, that we're hoping to see a church uh, come to fruition in, in maybe the next year or two. And we're looking forward to that. It's one thing that we do. We're still doing that. We have done that. But we were invited to do things there, not just by the invitation of the people, but by the invitation of Scripture. Uh, scripture invites me and you to, to love people in real, tangible ways. And they struggle for simple things that me and you have grown up with. At least most of us have. I'm one that grew up with fresh water. It was always available for me to drink. Never in a life that is mine do I remember a time when I couldn't go into my home and turn on a faucet and there was water available for me to, uh, and my mother to cook with, to wash with, to, 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 to drink. 
uh, those things. But for much of the world, that is just not the case. And uh, there's lots of tragedy that comes with a lack of clean water in the world. Uh, we have been invited to participate in that, and we've done water wells this year. We did one, and if you come to our gala, you'll see a, a short video this year uh, that we'll show in testimony uh, of what it's like to be there, to see fresh water come for the very first time in a community. Let me tell you, it'll change your perspective uh, to see the celebration that takes place when they have it. It's, it's not a small thing. It's a, it's a huge thing. And uh, I never once celebrated water coming out of a faucet, you know. And uh, so it's, it's, it's humbling to be in that situation, have the opportunity to bring it and see what God does. This church has participated in bringing that financially and with your prayers and uh, for 18, 20 years now. Um, we also joined Christ in his mission to uh, translate scripture and to distribute scripture. Uh, we have done um, Ligby Bible Project. Some of you have rem remembered that project. We, did, we created a language and translated the New Testament into that language uh, for an unreached people group. They're still unreached. Uh, the Ligbys maintain 100% Muslim identity because if anyone becomes a Christian, they're no longer Ligby. They, they, they lose their family, they lose, they lose everything that they, that they knew in order to become a Christian. And uh, so um, that group will be 100% unreached until they no longer exist. That's the mentality that's there. It's a, they're difficult to reach because it's, they're difficult to reach. Their leadership doesn't, that insulates them. Lots of things do that in the world. By the way, if it's a, a group that doesn't know Christ today, it's because they are hard to reach. And uh, a lot of our missionaries uh, struggle to go in places that are unsafe. Um, I just remind you of God's word. Jesus sent his own disciples out and said, I send you out as lambs among wolves. If your question is, am I going to be safe? It wasn't, it wasn't intended to be safe. If you're secure in Christ, that is your safety. And uh, so um, we participate in distrib distribution of God's Word as well as development there and, uh, and still do that. The little memory cards, we're still distributing those. I have uh, three complete Bible and audio. Uh, audio Bible is an important ministry today. If you have opportunities to participate in it, lots of different ways to do that. You're doing that with our church through our ministry, but there's Wycliffe Bible Institute, Biblia. There's lots of them out there that you can participate in. Dynamic, awesome way to get the scriptures out to people that desperately need to hear it, but they can't read or can't read well. And uh, the audio, uh, especially for a Muslim or, or maybe a Buddhist in an area where if they're caught reading scripture, they could lose their life or, or lose their family. Uh, they can put that little chip in their little phone and listen to it on earbuds that nobody knows. And uh, so it's, it's a great way to get that out there. And, uh, uh, but also, not just with that community, our world is suffering from extreme, I will call Bible abuse. Uh, these are so-called pastors preaching to people who can't read or can't read well and use the Bible to extort money from them for their own personal needs. And that's, that's the Africa is filled with that, India is filled with that. We got some of that going on in the States. And uh, uh, so moms and dads, hear me. Your child's ability to read is important. And uh, don't leave that to your school to do that. Uh, recent study just came out and it's interesting to me that they compared a child's ability to read by learning from a screen and a child's ability to read from learning from a book wasn't even close the book wins and uh, uh, so if your school has gone into uh, 
technology, that's great, but uh, it can be a hindrance to vocabulary development, reading development, content, all the things that they need so that they can read the scriptures. And if they have a false prophet stand in front of them, they'll be able to see that. And uh, we need that in our world today. So I encourage you to read to your children at home and use the scriptures to do their reading. That way you combine two things at once. And they can learn from it. Uh, I've got a, a child on my front porch in West Africa that's been learning to read from the scriptures since she was five. Uh, she'll be uh, uh, eight years old uh, on the 8th of February. Uh, that's coming right at our front. And I'm telling you, she can read. And she can read the Bible. And uh, it's, just, it's just a great experience to, to, to go through that. But that's another area of ministry that we have. We have two schools in West Africa, and we're teaching them how to read. And we're teaching them how to read from Scripture. And uh, uh, we feed children in that school because they need to eat. And most of the time, their parents will send them to school, and they won't have money for food. If they go to a setting, they'll go to, they'll go to school, and they won't eat all day until they get home. And uh, so we're providing meals to about, anywhere, depending on the year, anywhere from 600 to 800, uh, five days a week in the middle of the day uh, for, for those children. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see the results of that. Um, and we're reaching, reaching the, into their lives with the scriptures. And, uh, uh, and what's amazing is to see what happens to our teachers when they're required to teach scripture. Let me tell you, if you want to know the Bible, volunteer as a teacher to teach it. You'll learn more as a teacher than you ever did listening to a pastor, uh, either me or Cliff. And I, and I know he's a great teacher as well. And, uh, but learning how to teach the scriptures is, is probably one of the best ways you'll ever learn scripture. Uh, and we need more, not less of it, in our own hearts, our own minds, and in the lives of our family and our children. And uh, the world's pushing against that. But you need to push back and make it happen. And you can do that. And uh, a lot of folks will challenge me and say, well, you just don't have time for that. Let me translate to you what I hear when I hear someone say, my life is just too full. I don't have time for that. What I'm hearing is knowing God in my house is not a priority. God is revealed to us through the scriptures. That's how we know him. And if your desire to know God is a priority in your life, you'll make Scripture a priority in your life. And uh, don't depend on preachers and Sunday school teachers to do all that for you. You need to be able to do it yourself. God will bless that. He's blessed that in my life. He's blessed that in the lives of people around me who have embraced that. And he'll bless yours as well. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, your church, by the way, has joined our effort. This year, we will be having our celebration dinner on the 24th of February at 4.30 in Coontz, Texas, at First Baptist Church there. Uh, you're invited. Uh, we'll do all the things that Baptists do as uh, we'll get together and, 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 uh, and reconnect. Uh, we'll have a chance to listen to testimony primarily. We won't have a sermon, if you will, this year. We'll do, be doing testimonies, and uh, uh, we'll be doing some singing. And uh, so you get a chance to do some singing, and we'll do what Baptists always do, which is what? Eat. 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 Exactly. We're going to have we're gonna have some good food there. You'll get a chance to eat, and we'll try to do our best to get you out of there by, by, by 7 or 7.15. And uh, your church has a table there. Uh, we just recently received a check, and uh, what you'll be purchasing is miles on a Subaru vehicle that we hope to buy. Why is that important? Uh, in ministry. I can't get food to the kids without driving to the market and buying it and bringing it back to the school. The vehicle will be used for that. I can't distribute uh, scripture unless I've got a way to take it. Uh, all of those kinds of things are important. We bought a van nine years ago. We had 400,000 extremely hard miles on that van and I had the engine rebuilt. Yeah, it was, looks like it's been in a razor blade fight and lost. And uh, uh, 
we had the engine rebuilt about 80,000 miles ago, and it's still relatively strong, uh, but the body is weak, even though the spirit <laughs> is willing. And it's in the shop about every other week, and uh, it's getting to a place where we're going to need to at least slow it down. And uh, uh, so we're looking to, to maybe buy a little Subaru of some kind. The 4x4 four four that they make is really, really good at getting to the places we go. Our ministry is primarily rural. We're not in cities too much. And uh, uh, most of the churches we're planning or the few people that I've had come over, they will, they will say, how did you find this place? <laughs> and, uh, you know, because our ministry really is scattered and hard to get to in uh, some of the places we go to. And uh, having a four by four to get us there is, is a good thing. And some places we can't get there with a four by four. We use our feet and, uh, or whatever we can to get to them. And uh, that's our ministry. And I thank you for being a part of that. Um, we also are participating in, in medical side, and uh, uh, we've had some donations, not just from this church, but from uh, Sabine County, um, significant, that have helped us rebuild a clinic uh, very close to uh, th that place where I live uh, that is serving people that otherwise would be dead if they didn't have it. Um, the care we have available to us I mean we complain about it because maybe it doesn't measure up from time to time but let me tell you you need to be happy for what you got you really really do and uh, uh, same thing for those people who are, are taking care of the roads brag on your commissioners uh, I'm just I'm just telling you when when there are potholes big enough for your car to fit in that I have to drive through, and uh, uh, that have been been there for the whole time I've been in Ghana, nobody fixed them. So um, brag on them. But uh, that's the participation. One of, uh, would be encouraged to see you. One of the reasons to come to places like the celebration dinner is not just to enjoy food and and get a chance to see things that it does encourage the people who are doing the ministry that you came and celebrated with them. And it would be for me as well. And uh, so I hope to see you there. Um, wow. Another thing I appreciate about, about, about Rose Vine is they don't <laughs> typically put a time limit on me here. Uh, uh, I didn't even stand up here until almost 12 o'clock. I want to spend some time in God's Word because I don't believe we just do justice to Sunday unless we do, but I, I am going to preface what I'm going to teach with you today is that the scripture we're going to read is probably going to challenge some of you. Uh, how do I know that? It's because it's challenged me. And um, if you can, If this does challenge you, one of the things I want us to remember is that the scripture is right. And if what you hear today throws some challenges in the kinds of things that you'll put energy into, some of it could be political. Typically when I am challenged, it's because of some of the things that I've received politically. And... Uh, uh, this morning is, is, is very much so that way. Um, if you would, go, to, go with me to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 10. Moses is in a, a series of sermons in Deuteronomy is what he's doing, and he's preparing the nation of Israel to enter the promised land. This is the, at the end of his ministry, and they haven't gone in yet, and he's reminding them of a lot of things, so he's not going to be able to go in. So this is kind of the, uh, his last word, if you will, and uh, he's, he's, he, he's, he, he's loved these people. He's, he's served these people for a long time now, I mean, and, and he's, he's preaching into their lives and, and, uh, in an effort to help them grab a hold of all of the things that God has brought through their journey together in the hopes that if he summarizes it, 
in a series of sermons, it might help them when they cross over into the promised land because he knows he's not going to be with them. He's been told that. And uh, so we'll be reading in chapter 10, beginning uh, in, I think, verse 12 of uh, the chapter 10 of Deuteronomy. He has just rewritten the tablets. Remember, he, he, he... He's reminding them of that event. What caused the first ones to be bad is because they were bad. And he shattered them. And God's given him instructions, remember, to rewrite them. And he's done that. Uh, uh, He's reviewed the Ten Commandments in chapter 5. That's the beginning of this sermon. So everything you're looking back in in this message is looking back and reflecting on on those, uh, those commandments. And uh, in verse 12, he says, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? What a question. Most of what we're going to be seeing from from here going forward is is in an effort by Moses to help Israel understand what is required of them. We do have expectations that God places upon us. And he's going to, and I, I remember when I first became a Christian, I, 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 was, I was so excited about being a part of a forgiven family. And I wanted to know God, and I really wanted to know what he wanted of me. And now he's going to answer that question for Israel. What is required of you? First thing on the list is fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and His statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Looking back at the Ten Commandments. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven, and the highest heavens, and the earth, and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set His affection to love them. And he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So, circumcise your heart, stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great and the mighty and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor takes a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him. And you shall swear by his name. He is your praise and He is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord add His blessings to the reading of His Word this morning. God has given us a tremendous opportunity here this morning to listen to some things that we need to hear, for me to listen to some things that I need to hear. And the very first thing that he tells us is what's required, and I believe this is a harmony. This is not something we go through and we have to emphasis on one and not the other. These things blend together so that if we do all of the things that he tells us here, that we fear him, that we walk in his ways, that we do all the things that he's talking about in this this scripture, and do that, serving Him, loving Him, uh, and we do that with all of our heart and all of our soul, keeping His commandments and His statutes. Those are the things that are required. Let us reflect on that. A lot of the things that, that, that I have seen as a believing Baptist, a lot of the leanings that come into life or that my faith and the foundation in it resides my salvation 
And many times when I have read in the scriptures the kinds of things that call me to action, and I've heard it from a pulpit, many of the times it will always be questioned. Is my salvation in those things? And most of the time that's in an effort to protect the doctrine that once we're saved, we're always saved. And we're not saved by works. And yet God is calling us here to action. Why is He doing that if it doesn't mean anything? May we all be reminded that we're not called to prove that salvation is by grace and through faith alone and not by works, by doing no works. We're saved so that we can be equipped for good works prepared in advance for us to do. And God is calling us to action here so that we can see that He's called us, like He has called the nation of Israel, to do some things. And by that, we love. He chose the nation of Israel even though He owned everything. It's all His. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. Nothing left out. Nothing resides outside of His sovereignty. Everything that is, everything that has been, everything that will be is His, always has been, always will be, and yet He chose the nation of Israel out of all of that to set His affection on. And if me and you today reside in that nation as being ones who were brought near, even though we were far at one time, brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ so that we could be engrafted into the family of God that He has chosen and illustrating that He's chosen here in the nation of Israel. If we find ourselves in that this day, He's calling us. And He's calling us with special affection. He loves us. Sent His own Son to do what? To die for me and you. Because He chose us. The elect of the world. The elect of creation. The special affection of God resides on you if you are in Him. So. So. So what? Circumcise your hearts. No longer let the heart that you possess be stony and hard. No longer stiffen your neck when you hear the commands. Do them. That's it. When you hear the commands, do them. You remember Jesus' response to the lawyer who asked him, what must I do? And Jesus asked him, have you read the law? Do you remember? How does it read to you? And the lawyer said, love God with all your heart and all your soul, all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responded and said, rightly. Have you answered? And then he said this. Do this and you'll live. Knowing the right answer is not enough. Doing the right answer is evidence that you know it. Amen? Amen. And here... Moses is reminding the nation of Israel and those of us who find ourselves in the grace that he has extended to them. Now, though we were once far away, been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
we find ourselves in this nation as one commanded to circumcise our heart and stiffen our necks no longer. Why? Verse 17, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, Lord of lords, great and mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. In other words, you're in Him. You've been circumcised on the eighth day. You've been baptized. I mean, I'm a Baptist. Doesn't that say something? I've been attending church. Doesn't that say something? I think it does. I think it says great things. but don't believe you're safe from God's judgment if you choose to do nothing when He commands you to do it. Don't think you're safe from God's judgment if you choose to sin willfully and walk in it. He's saying, I am not partial. And you can't put in front of me anything you can do, will do, or could do in an effort to turn my judgment against you if you do not do what I tell you to do. We're not safe. We've been told that over and over again, that we're safe. And God's Word is telling us that our safety resides in fear of Him. Fear has been taken off the table in America. It's a negative thing. It's a thing that you're not supposed to walk in. Because if you walk in fear, I mean, that's, that's, that's not positive. And we've been given this idea that if it's not rosy and positive, it's not good for us. It might damage our self-esteem. My daddy did some things on my backside that damaged my self-esteem many times over and did me good every time he damaged it. And the discipline that comes from God is to those whom he loves. And if we don't receive it, the word of Hebrew says we're illegitimate. We're not even his. So, no partiality, no bribes. Now we're getting to where the rubber meets the road. Where's the evidence? Remember his... Command to walk in everything he walks. He executes justice for the orphan. So what should we be doing if we're walking in what he walks in? Executing justice for the orphan. And the what? And the widow. Showing his love for the what? Alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien. For you were aliens and the land of Egypt. Stop. Two weeks ago, uh, actually about three weeks ago, I received an invitation from from the border. A man asked me if I'd go preach in the Mexican prison, most notorious one, on the border in Piedras Negras. Some of you may remember the, no, the news, they, were, they buried bodies, the cartels did, and associated with that particular prison. And my suspicion is there's probably a handful of Fox News watchers in this room. Eagle Pass has not been touted as a safe place to be. It's a place of confusion place of not good things happening and I got to go to Eagle Pass to get to Piedras Negras I've also been told that Piedras Negras was a place of violence that a white man can't go there and be safe do I accept the invitation and I did I had other people that wanted to go with me and they did research and then decided not to go because of the 
image that was given. So I get to Eagle Pass, and I have to cross into Mexico right where Shelby Park has been barricaded. And razor wire is just being added, and just piles and piles, gigantic piles of razor wire all the way along that park. It's a huge park. It's, a, it's a sizable. For those of you who may not be familiar with, with Eagle Pass, there are two bridges that cross the Rio Grande there. And that's just pedestrian ones. There's also trains. And the whole time you're there, it never stops. Tremendous amount of freight. There's a lot of money passing through that town. And uh, I'm crossing that bridge. And I'm asking myself, looking at the razor wire, if my God were here looking at that with me, would I be able to say that's welcoming the alien? I couldn't. And what's the wire about? Is it about me sharing my food with the alien or is it about me keeping my food from the alien? It shook me when I considered the answers to those questions. So I went back into God's Word and started asking the question, how should, according to God's word, should I treat the alien? And who really is an alien? I'm going to read a few scriptures to you. These are scattered. If you want copies of this, you can. But these are just a few from the research that I did. Leviticus 27, 19. Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner and the fatherless or the widow. Then all the people shall say amen. Job 29, verse 15 and 17. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I championed the cause of the stranger. I broke the fangs of unrighteousness and made them drop their prey from their teeth. Ezekiel 47, 22. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who reside among you and have begotten children among you. They shall be to you as citizens of Israel. And, they, and, you, and with you, they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Matthew 25, 35. I was hungry. I, there is Jesus. And you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Just a handful of scriptures. I've got just two pages here. I didn't read all of them. But the challenge to me is not about what the government is fighting over. The challenge to me is how do I hear? How do I address what God would have me do here, in me, and by me? How does that affect my mind and my heart? How can I claim to have a heart and a mind that's after God's heart and God's mind? and not have affection for people that are not Americans. The fact is that if there's a place in my heart and my mind that says no to Christians who want to be here, could I look at God and His face and find a reason not to be and justify that? 
The truth is, I've done that. And I believe in the last two weeks, God is asking me to repent from that. This is the first time I've ever spoken on this topic in any church. But I believe the timing was right for me. God saw me and you as aliens. He sent Jesus Christ to welcome and invite me and you to be a part of a kingdom that was not ours. And for me to look at another nation and say, you're not welcome, is for me not to be one with my God. How does he continue? You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise and he is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in heaven. One of the things he's doing here, and I'll close with this, The thought, the way Moses is addressing this in the scriptures is he's reminding the nation of Israel that, that they had been aliens residing in a nation that was not theirs. And I think there's a reason he did that. And I think it's because He's appealing to their sense of empathy, the thing that they learned when they were there. I, uh, I have difficulty connecting with things that are not flesh and blood. When I turn on Facebook, for instance, and I'm trying to connect with a person that's there I just can't get there does that make sense I can't feel their presence I can't I can't smell the air I can't hear their voices I can't look and see expression and feel it taste it know it but when we have the opportunity to be with people who suffer. It changes the way we see life. It changes the way we read Scripture. It changes the way we look at people who are of a different place than us. And the way it does it is it gives us the compassion that God has so that when we're with them, we can love them the way He loves them. He didn't send His Son to die for America. He sent His Son to die for the world. For God so loved the world that He gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in Him, they will never perish, but they will have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, as we come to our time today, time of invitation by you to us, May it be embraced by those here and those who will hear because of you. 
circumcise our hearts, God. Take us and make us into the very people that chase after you in such a way that we want to walk in the ways that you walk, that we want to serve in the ways that you serve. We want to love in the ways that you love. And if that includes the widow, the orphan, and even the alien who is trying to come to our country, Father, I pray that we would love not in a small way, but we would love in a sacrificial way, the way you loved us through your son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.